today we're here at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee with our amazing tour guide, Ryan Jones. How are you today? I'm well, and yourself? Good to meet you. All right. Well, what do we have here? We're starting out and this is the tunnel you come in, right? Yeah, this is basically a condensed timeline of what you would have seen in the original Civil Rights Museum, which opened here in 1991. Beginning in the year 1619, 20 African slaves were brought to this country in Jamestown, Virginia, and they were sold into what we call slavery. And once they would do this, many African Americans and some white abolitionists would try and fight against the oppression of slavery. They would take some civil approaches and they would take some violent approaches. Some of the most important leaders during this time was Mr. Frederick Douglass, Miss Harriet Tubman, and the radical Nat Turner of 1831. Well, they saw that it was wrong right from the bat, right? Absolutely, absolutely. What are some of the things going on here? And we have President Lincoln, huh? Absolutely. In 1861, 13 southern states no longer wanted to be a part of what we call the United States of America. So they decided to fight a war, which was known as the American Civil War. Absolutely. And Lincoln wants to do something that no other president had done before this time. So on January the 1st, 1863, exactly 150 years ago this year, he issues the Emancipation Proclamation, which is supposed to free the slaves in this country, which in fact, it's not free one slave because this was only a military document and only a constitutional amendment could completely abolish slavery. Yeah, it's still a lot of work to be done. At that Absolutely. Time. And then we move down this way and we get into, you know, the 1900s, which Things weren't right yet. Things still weren't right. In 1954, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP said that children should be able to go to the same schools in this country. So on Monday, May the 17th, 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. This was the first major landmark decision in the civil rights movement. And this is what led to so many of those marches and demonstrations that Dr. King and many more other civil rights organizations began to be involved with. Yeah, picking up off of that moment, was Miss Rosa Parks actually decided not to give up a seat on an Alabama bus to a white man and this sparked the Montgomery bus boycott which is where we see a 26 year old Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. first show his face in the civil rights movement and so for 381 days African Americans decide not to walk they decide to walk use carpool and black owned taxis to get back and forth to their destinations 381 days after that the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in these buses was unconstitutional and this was the first major accomplishment and achievement of the civil rights movement and of Dr. King as a civil rights leader. But it started things going, didn't it? Absolutely. A lot, a lot of things hurting people and a lot of things where, you know, there's a lot of riots and, and, and challenges for people, weren't there? Many atrocities. Perhaps the biggest and turning point of the civil rights movement was exactly 50 years ago in 1963. Dr. King leads a campaign in Birmingham known as Project Confrontation. And this is where you see those infamous footages of little innocent children, four years old to 17 years old, being attacked by police dogs and German shepherds and water hoses. And this was also where Dr. King delivers his most famous speech, the I Have a Dream speech on Absolutely. August the 28th of 1963, which is where he says, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We're getting there too. After the civil rights movement won many of these battles with President Kennedy proposing the civil rights legislation, which later becomes the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and gives African Americans the right to vote under federal law with the voting rights of 1965. Dr. King is going from being just not just a civil rights leader, but he's going to try and be a human rights leader. And mainly in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, African-American sanitation workers were only receiving a dollar and four cents an hour. So Dr. King decides to come here to march on behalf of the striking sanitation workers. And it's here he leads a march. And this march turns out to be the only march that Dr. King leads in his entire tenure as a civil rights leader that turns out to be a violent march. So he's forced to retreat from Memphis and he comes back on Wednesday, April the 3rd, and he stays at the historic Lorraine Motel, which is where the Civil Rights Museum stands today. That's where we are today. Going into the rest of that day on April the 3rd, Dr. King delivers his second most famous speech. And he quotes and says, like anyone, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now because I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. On that very night, that was the very last speech that Dr. King would have delivered in his short 39 years of life. Well, and on this tour, we can actually see that spot. Yeah, and that's where we'll actually take you to right next, and then we'll go and talk about the last moments in the last day of Dr. King's life. Wow, that's amazing. We're looking forward to it. All right. Here we go. 
Well, Ryan, looks like we're uh, in a pretty special place right here. Yeah, we're at the Real Lorraine Motel. Okay. In the 50s and 60s, many famous African-American celebrities would stay here at the Lorraine Motel, such as Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, and Ray Charles. However, the most famous celebrity was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. King returned to the city of Memphis in April of 1968. And he was placed in room 306. And we'll discuss those tragic events that took place on that day as we walk on the balcony and stand where Dr. King There's stayed. There's two, two cars here. Sure. And what's the yeah, significance? These, these are 1964 and 1967 Cadillacs and Dodges. And these cars were replicas of the actual models that were here at the time of the fatal assassination. So we kind of had these cars put here to create the effect of how it was in 1968 here at the Lorraine Motel. Give you the vibe and the feel, huh? Definitely. There's a wreath here. The wreath was put here to show exactly where Dr. King was standing on the balcony when he was hit by the assassin's bullet. So we okay. commemorate right the wreath here. here right exactly at this exact moment. Wow. Well, let's go on up and check it out. All right, let's go. All right. And what's really good about this is that this is the original frame. Nothing has been changed at the, at the Lorraine Motel's frame wow. since 1968. So we're touching history right here. And now we're going to room 306 here at the Lorraine Motel. This is where Dr. King was placed with Ralph Abernathy on the afternoon of Wednesday, April 3rd, 1968. On the following day after Dr. King delivered that famous I've been to the mountaintop mm -hmm. speech, Dr. King and some of his associates, such as Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young, and the Reverend Samuel Billy Cos of Memphis were getting ready to go in eat dinner at Reverend Kyle's home that night. Dr. King steps outside the balcony and he stands right here and he's getting ready to go in downstairs with some of his colleagues. And the, one of the first peoples that he's addressed is Reverend Jesse Jackson from Chicago. Jesse Jackson says, Doc, is getting cold outside. You should go and grab a jacket. Dr. King is standing exactly in this position, and he says, all right, I'll get a coat. At that exact moment, the fatal shot rings out. Dr. King is hitting the right jaw and neck area. It pierces his jugular vein and spinal cord, and it lodges in his left shoulder blade. Dr. King falls wounded right in this area that we see here on the balcony. At the time of the assassination, Reverend Ralph Abernathy runs inside of room 306. And on the very same exact telephone that's in the room right now, he's trying to phone the switchboard operator. Well, she's not answering her phone. The switchboard operator was Miss Lori Bailey, the co-owner of the Lorraine Motel. She's run outside of her office because she hears a loud noise ring, and she looks up on the balcony and sees what happens to Dr. King, and she goes into a seizure and has a heart attack on the spot. She dies four days later from her injuries. Dr. King was taken from the balcony to St. Joseph's Hospital, where he was later pronounced dead at 7.05 p.m. And riots and violence erupted throughout the entire United States of America in the wake and aftermath of Dr. King's assassination, with the exception of Indianapolis. In April of 1968, Senator Robert F. Kennedy was running for president of the election year of 1968, and he has to break the news to an all African American community about Dr. King's death. And he gives a speech that night saying that Dr. King would have wanted this community and this country to remain peaceful, being the nonviolent man that he was. Wow, and it's all coming back now. That's nice. They're, re, they're revamping everything here. And you know, the thing that I've noticed too is that you guys are constantly upgrading. Definitely. This museum. Yes, definitely. After November of 2012, the National Civil Rights Museum is undergoing a major extensive renovation campaign, which is what we're going to do is that we're just going to update the technology, more digital act interaction. We're going to have many more stories told about the civil rights struggle that uh, goes a lot more in depth than Dr. King, Rosa Parks, sure. Frederick Douglass. And we're just going to give a place for children and the youth and all people, tourists all over the world, can come here and learn about this dark history of American history. So we got to remember. Absolutely. In order to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. Wow, amazing. First, we're going to go into the who murdered Dr. King. And one of the first sides is James Orray was a lone gunman. James Orray was an escaped convict in the Missouri State Penitentiary. And when he goes to Atlanta, Georgia, he's going to kill Dr. King because it's said by the FBI that he was a follower of George Wallace. When Dr. King publicly denounces Wallace running for 37th president of this country, he says that we have to take this man out. So he purchases this 1965 Mustang for $1,900 and he drives to Atlanta. He buys a map circling Dr. King's home, his job, and his church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is still in Atlanta today. When he realizes that Dr. King is not in Atlanta, he's here in the city of Memphis. So he goes in that Mustang and he drives from Atlanta to Birmingham. When he's in Birmingham, he buys two rifles. The first rifle, he takes it back saying that it was the wrong size. Whatever happens to that rifle, we have no idea to this day. He takes a second rifle and he brings that rifle from Birmingham into Memphis and he checks in in the Young Amora rooming house on the day of the assassination. Now you have to keep in mind that on April the 4th of 1968, it was front page of the Memphis 
Memphis Commercial Appeal newspaper that not only was Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, he was at the Lorraine Motel downtown. Not only was he at the Lorraine, he was in room 306. And is this the actual hotel? This is the actual Yonder Morrow Rooming House wow. boarding house. And what we're about to go and look at now is the room that James R. Ray allegedly stayed in and the bathroom that he allegedly fired the fatal shot from under the alias of John Willard. This is amazing. This is getting deep now. It is. It Let's is. go check that out. This is the actual room. Yeah. Recreation of the actual yeah, this room. Yeah. Or is this the actual room? Yeah, this is the actual room of wow. room 5B from the Young and Moral Rooming House. It's said that James O'Ray, under the alias of John Willard, checks into this room so that he could be very close to see where Dr. King was going to be so that he could try and maybe get a fatal shot. So Ray is said to have left this bedroom and take this, that second rifle that he purchased in Alabama and he comes into this bathroom and he purchased himself into this bathtub. And this and it's literally window, in the bathtub, and this is the actual window. This is the actual window where the FBI said the fatal shot was fired that murdered Martin Luther King Jr. Whoa. Now, is this the same position? Same position. This bathroom is in the exact same position and left, because you, as you can see, intact with where it was. So now, which way is the Lorraine from here, is it? It's that way. So he kind of stuck out the window and shot that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. And we'll, we put these mirror, these windows here to show the exact type of shot that Ray would have gotten oh, right from this area. Yeah. Right. So as we look through, we can see the balcony, and that's exactly where the bathtub, right on the other side of that wall. Absolutely. And as you look through, we can see it's a pretty much a straight shot. Pretty much. So when after this happens, Dr. Dr. King is mortally wounded on the balcony. Ray leaves the bathroom and he goes into his, his room and puts the rifle into a bundle and he runs downstairs and runs outside and he kind of panics and he's thinking, if I have this weapon in my possession when I make my getaway, that's it, they're gonna get me. So he abandons the weapon. This weapon has his fingerprint on it, right outside of what is the gift shop of the National Civil Rights Museum today. And he leaves that Mustang in Atlanta, gets on a plane and flies from Atlanta to Toronto, from Toronto to London, from London to Portugal, and Portugal back to London before he's finally captured 65 days after the assassination of Dr. King kind of crazy. Absolutely. It doesn't stop there. Ray then is extradited back to Memphis, Tennessee, and he retains an attorney that says, James, there's far too much circumstantial evidence saying that you were the only person involved in the assassination of Dr. King. So if you plead guilty and waive your right to trial, you maybe you'll receive a small punishment because at this time in this country, in the deep south, if you were white, accused of killing an African American, you would receive no time at all. Maybe not even be arrested. So if you take a plea bargain, maybe you'll get off. He's thinking he's going to get a light sentence in return he pleads guilty and he receives 99 years in the state penitentiary, which is where he dies in the eight, at the year of 1998 with liver cancer. Wow. Wow, so he got what he got, didn't he? Sure. I mean, a lot of people suggest that Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered by James O'Reilly due to the circumstantial evidence. However, 85% of the American population believes that Martin Luther King Jr. was not assassinated by James O'Reilly. No one said that they saw James O'Reilly in this bathroom. 45 minutes went by, and from 5.45 to 6.20, 6.25, no one said that they saw a man that even resembled Ray in that bathroom. Instead, there were six eyewitnesses in the Lorraine Motel parking lot, and when the fatal shot rang out, they all claimed to have seen a man in this area right below us. Out on the grass? Out on the grass. This was a grassy and brushy area. We can see right through here. There's the grass, and there's right. still a good, clean shot. And this is kind of like the Memphis grassy you knoll, as you'll see in Dallas at the Sixth Floor Museum. Six witnesses said that they saw a man with the rifle and a puff of smoke in this area running and jumping off of that retaining wall running this way towards Healing Avenue. All six of these eyewitnesses went and told their story to the Memphis FBI. All six were ignored. Hmm, plot thickens, doesn't it? Definitely. Well, let's check it out and see what else you got. Well, so this is the evidence, and this is what you wanted to show us. So what do we have here? Yeah, this is the actual evidence case, state's evidence case against James O'Reilly. The highlight is the actual 760 Gang Master 30-06 rifle that was found with James O'Reilly's fingerprints the actual... on it. The actual weapon, right. Well, this weapon was finally tested in 1994 when the, it came out that Dr. King could have been killed as a result of a conspiracy. And number five here is the actual shell casing, oh, yeah. and number 11 is the actual bullet pulled out of Dr. King left back shoulder blade. These That's two, the actual, literally actual, actual bullet. bullet that and that is the actual King. bullet, right the in this case. Bullet. In this wow, case. That's amazing. It was preserved all this time, and it does not match the rifle that was recovered at the assassination. So 
many conspiracy theorists suggest that maybe this weapon was to frame James O'Reilly, who openly admitted to buying two weapons right before he came to Memphis, Tennessee. In con conclusion with the assassination and looking at a conspiracy, Dr. King was doing some very important things that would have made a lot of people extra angry. And probably the most important was his opposition to the war in Vietnam. And with conspiracy theories connecting President Kennedy's murder to Dr. King's murder, along with Senator Robert F. Kennedy's murder, all three men were completely emphatically against the war in Vietnam. Is it a coincidence that both all three men were assassinated five years apart? Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were killed exceptionally two months apart from each other. Lone gummins rarely use rifles. If we look at the history of political assassinations, Abraham Lincoln, President James Garfield, William McKinley, Senator Kennedy were all shot with pistols, but the only, only two assassinations that flirt with the act of conspiracy are President John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King saying that a lone nut fires a high-powered rifle from a tall office building, murdering both men. Is it a coincidence or not? Great, but this was definitely food for thought, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Makes you think. It's, a, it's a very, very highlight to talk about. Everybody thinks about Dr. King being assassinated and the very much impact that it had, but who would have wanted to do this and why? So this brings us to the end of our tour. I mean, there's so much more here than what we've seen, but this is kind of the future, right? Right, right. This room goes into the, the shift from civil rights to human rights. It talks about women's rights, all different rights for all different people outside of the race movement from 1970s all the way to present day 2013. Right on. And this is something, you know, that w Dr. King would have probably advocated, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, the thing that Dr. King said in his dream is actually living out to what we're doing today. Everyone is able to go to school, right to vote exercising all their citizenship and constitutional rights that our forefathers gave in 1776. Well, that's part of the dream that he talked about, right? Yeah, this is the dream that Dr. King was talking about. All these people are having the right to vote, having the right to an education, and being able to exercise their constitutional rights that our forefathers gave in 1776. That's right. Inalienable rights for all men, right? All men. So it's, it's moving forward, and we got a little bit to do. Yep. But guess what? If we don't remember the past, and that's what this is all about, we can't have a bright future, can we? Right. In order to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. That's right. Well, thank you so much for being with us here today. And until next time, just remember to enjoy. enjoy.